Chapter Five of Book Two of On the Heavens by Aristotle, translated by J. L. Stocks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jeffrey Edwards. Chapter Five. Now there are two ways of moving along a circle from A to B or from a to c and we have already explained that these movements are not contrary to one another but nothing which concerns the eternal can be a matter of chance or spontaneity and the heaven and its circular motion are eternal we must therefore ask why this motion takes one direction and not the other either this is itself an ultimate fact or there is an ultimate fact behind it it may seem evidence of excessive folly or excessive zeal to try to provide an explanation of some things or of everything admitting no exception the criticism however is not always just one should first consider what reason there is for speaking and also what kind of certainty is looked for whether human merely or of a more cogent kind when any one shall succeed in finding proofs of greater precision gratitude will be due to him for the discovery but at present we must be content with a probable solution if nature always follows the best course possible and just as upward movement is the superior form of rectilinear movement since the upper region is more divine than the lower so forward movement is superior to backward then front and back exhibits like right and left as we said before and as the difficulty just stated itself suggests the distinction of prior and posterior which provides a reason and so solves our difficulty supposing that nature is ordered in the best way possible this may stand as the reason of the fact mentioned for it is best to move with a movement simple and unceasing and further in the superior of two possible directions chapter six we have next to show that the movement of the heaven is regular and not irregular this applies only to the first heaven and the first movement for the lower spheres exhibit a composition of several movements into one if the movement is uneven clearly there will be acceleration maximum speed and retardation since these appear in all irregular motions the maximum may occur either at the starting point or at the goal or between the two and we expect natural motion to reach its maximum at the goal unnatural motion at the starting point and missiles midway between the two but circular movement having no beginning or limit or middle in the direct sense of the words has neither whence nor whither nor middle for in time it is eternal and in length it returns upon itself without a break if then its movement has no maximum it can have no irregularity since irregularity is produced by a retardation and acceleration further since everything that is moved is moved by something the cause of the irregularity of movement must lie either in the mover or in the moved or in both for if the mover moved not always with the same force or if the moved were altered and did not remain the same or if both were to change the result might well be an irregular movement in the moved but none of these possibilities can be conceived as actual in the case of the heavens as to that which is moved we have shown that it is primary and simple and ungenerated and indestructible and generally unchanging and the mover has an even better right to these attributes it is the primary that moves the primary the simple the simple the indestructible and ungenerated that which is indestructible and ungenerated 
since then that which is moved being a body is nevertheless unchanging how should the mover which is incorporeal be changed it follows then further that the motion cannot be irregular for if irregularity occurs there must be change either in the movement as a whole from fast to slow and slow to fast or in its parts that there is no irregularity in the parts is obvious since if there were some divergence of the stars would have taken place before now in the infinity of time as one moved slower and another faster but no alteration of their intervals is ever observed nor again is a change in the movement as a whole admissible retardation is always due to incapacity and incapacity is unnatural the incapacities of animals age decay and the like are all unnatural due it seems to the fact that the whole animal complex is made up of materials which differ in respect of their proper places and no single part occupies its own place if therefore that which is primary contains nothing unnatural being simple and unmixed and in its proper place and having no contrary then it has no place for incapacity nor consequently for retardation or since acceleration involves retardation for acceleration again it is inconceivable that the mover should first show incapacity for an infinite time and capacity afterwards for another infinity for clearly nothing which like incapacity is unnatural ever continues for an infinity of time nor does the unnatural endure as long as the natural or any form of incapacity as long as the capacity but if the movement is retarded it must necessarily be retarded for an infinite time equally impossible is perpetual acceleration or perpetual retardation for such movement would be infinite and indefinite but every movement in our view proceeds from one point to another and is definite in character again suppose one assumes a minimum time in less than which the heaven could not complete its movement for as a given walk or a given exercise on the harp cannot take any and every time but every performance has its definite minimum time which is unsurpassable so one might suppose the movement of the heaven could not be completed in any and every time but in that case perpetual acceleration is impossible and equally perpetual retardation for the argument holds of both and each if we may take acceleration to proceed by identical or increasing additions of speed and for an infinite time the remaining alternative is to say that the movement exhibits an alteration of slower and faster but this is a mere fiction and quite inconceivable further irregularity of this kind would be particularly unlikely to pass unobserved since contrast makes observation easy that there is one heaven then only and that it is ungenerated and eternal and further that its movement is regular has now been sufficiently explained chapter seven we have next to speak of the stars as they are called of their composition shape and movements it would be most natural and consequent upon what has been said that each of the stars should be composed of that substance in which their path lies since as we said there is an element whose natural movement is circular in so saying we are only following the same line of thought as those who say that the stars are fiery because they believe the upper body to be fire the presumption being that a thing is composed of the same stuff as that in which it is situated the warmth and light which proceed from them are caused by the friction set up in the air by their motion movement tends to create fire in wood stone and iron and with even more reason should it have that effect on air a substance which is closer to fire than these an example is that of missiles 
which as they move are themselves fired so strongly that leaden balls are melted and if they are fired the surrounding air must be similarly affected now while the missiles are heated by reason of their motion in air which is turned into fire by the agitation produced by their movement the upper bodies are carried on a moving sphere so that though they are not themselves fired yet the air underneath the sphere of the revolving body is necessarily heated by its motion and particularly in that part where the sun is attached to it hence warmth increases as the sun gets nearer or higher or overhead of the fact then that the stars are neither fiery nor move in fire enough has been said chapter eight since changes evidently occur not only in the position of the stars but also in that of the whole heaven there are three possibilities either one both are at rest or two both are in motion or three the one is at rest and the other in motion one that both should be at rest is impossible for if the earth is at rest the hypothesis does not account for the observations and we take it as granted that the earth is at rest it remains either that both are moved or that the one is moved and the other at rest two on the view first that both are in motion we have the absurdity that the stars and the circles move with the same speed i e that the pace of every star is that of the circle in which it moves for star and circle are seen to come back to the same place at the same moment from which it follows that the star has traversed the circle and the circle has completed its own movement i e traversed its own circumference at one and the same moment but it is difficult to conceive that the pace of each star should be exactly proportioned to the size of its circle that the pace of each circle should be proportionate to its size is not absurd but inevitable but that the same should be true of the movement of the stars contained in the circles is quite incredible for if on the one hand we suppose that the star which moves on the greater circle is necessarily swifter clearly we also admit that if stars shifted their position so as to exchange circles the slower would become swifter and the swifter slower but this would show that their movement was not their own but due to the circles if on the other hand the arrangement was a chance combination the coincidence in every case of a greater circle with a swifter movement of the star contained in it is too much to believe in one or two cases it might not inconceivably fall out so but to imagine it in every case alike is a mere fiction besides chance has no place in that which is natural and what happens everywhere and in every case is no matter of chance three the same absurdity is equally plain if it is supposed that the circles stand still and that it is the stars themselves which move for it will follow that the outer stars are the swifter and that the pace of the stars corresponds to the size of their circles since then we cannot reasonably suppose either that both are in motion or that the star alone moves the remaining alternative is that the circles should move while the stars are at rest and move with the circles to which they are attached only on this supposition are we involved in no absurd consequence for in the first place the quicker movement of the larger circle is natural when all the circles are attached to the same centre whenever bodies are moving with their proper motion the larger moves quicker it is the same here with the revolving bodies for the arc intercepted by two radii will be larger in the larger circle and hence it is not surprising that the revolution of the larger circle should take the same time as that of the smaller and secondly the fact that the heavens do not break in pieces follows not only from this but also from the proof already given of the continuity of the whole again since the stars are spherical as our opponents assert 
and we may consistently admit inasmuch as we construct them out of the spherical body and since the spherical body has two movements proper to itself namely rolling and spinning it follows that if the stars have a movement of their own it will be one of these but neither is observed one suppose them to spin they would then stay where they were and not change their place as by observation and general consent they do further one would expect them all to exhibit the same movement but the only star which appears to possess this movement is the sun at sunrise or sunset and this appearance is due not to the sun itself but to the distance from which we observe it the visual ray being excessively prolonged becomes weak and wavering the same reason probably accounts for the apparent twinkling of the fixed stars and the absence of twinkling in the planets the planets are near so that the visual ray reaches them in its full vigour but when it comes to the fixed stars it is quivering because of the distance and its excessive extension and its tremor produces an appearance of movement in the star for it makes no difference whether movement is set up in the ray or in the object of vision two on the other hand it is also clear that the stars do not roll for rolling involves rotation but the quotes, face as it is called of the moon is always seen therefore since any movement of their own which the stars possessed would presumably be one proper to themselves and no such movement is observed in them clearly they have no movement of their own there is further the absurdity that nature has bestowed upon them no organ appropriate to such movement for nature leaves nothing to chance and would not while caring for animals overlook things so precious indeed nature seems deliberately to have stripped them of everything which makes self-originated progression possible and to have removed them as far as possible from things which have organs of movement this is just why it seems proper that the whole heaven and every star should be spherical for while of all shapes the sphere is the most convenient for movement in one place making possible as it does the swiftest and most self-contained motion for forward movement it is the most unsuitable least of all resembling shapes which are self-moved in that it has no dependent or projecting part as a rectilinear figure has and is in fact as far as possible removed in shape from ambulatory bodies since therefore the heavens have to move in one place and the stars are not required to move themselves forward it is natural that both should be spherical a shape which best suits the movement of the one and the immobility of the other end of chapter eight recording in memory of mitchell edwards chapter nine of book two of on the heavens by aristotle translated by j l stocks this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by geoffrey edwards chapter nine from all this it is clear that the theory that the movement of the stars produces a harmony i e that the sounds they make are concordant in spite of the grace and originality with which it has been stated is nevertheless untrue some thinkers suppose that the motion of bodies of that size must produce a noise since on our earth the motion of bodies far inferior in size and in speed of movement has that effect also when the sun and the moon they say and all the stars so great in number and in size are moving with so rapid a motion how should they not produce a sound immensely great starting from this argument and from the observation that their speeds as measured by their distances 
are in the same ratios as musical concordances they assert that the sound given forth by the circular movement of the stars is a harmony since however it appears unaccountable that we should not hear this music they explain this by saying that the sound is in our ears from the very moment of birth and is thus indistinguishable from its contrary silence since sound and silence are discriminated by mutual contrast what happens to men then is just what happens to coppersmiths who are so accustomed to the noise of the smithy that it makes no difference to them but as we said before melodious and poetical as the theory is it cannot be a true account of the facts there is not only the absurdity of our hearing nothing the ground of which they try to remove but also the fact that no effect other than sensitive is produced upon us excessive noises we know shatter the solid bodies even of inanimate things the noise of thunder for instance splits rocks and the strongest of bodies but if the moving bodies are so great and the sound which penetrates to us is proportionate to their size that sound must needs reach us in an intensity many times that of thunder and the force of its action must be immense indeed the reason why we do not hear and show in our bodies none of the effects of violent force is easily given it is that there is no noise but not only is the explanation evident it is also a corroboration of the truth of the views we have advanced for the very difficulty which made the pythagoreans say that the motion of the stars produces a concord corroborates our view bodies which are themselves in motion produce noise and friction but those which are attached or fixed to a moving body as the parts to a ship can no more create noise than a ship on a river moving with the stream yet by the same argument one might say it was absurd that on a large vessel the motion of mast and poop should not make a great noise and the like might be said of the movement of the vessel itself but sound is caused when a moving body is enclosed in an unmoved body and cannot be caused by one enclosed in and continuous with a moving body which creates no friction we may say then in this matter that if the heavenly bodies moved in a generally diffused mass of air or fire as every one supposes their motion would necessarily cause a noise of tremendous strength and such a noise would necessarily reach and shatter us since therefore this effect is evidently not produced it follows that none of them can move with the motion either of animate nature or of constraint it is as though nature had foreseen the result that if their movement were other than it is nothing on this earth could maintain its character that the stars are spherical and are not self-moved has now been explained chapter ten with their order i mean the position of each as involving the priority of some and the posteriority of others and their respective distances from the extremity with this astronomy may be left to deal since the astronomical discussion is adequate this discussion shows that the movements of the several stars depend as regards the varieties of speed which they exhibit on the distance of each from the extremity it is established that the outermost revolution of the heavens is a simple movement and the swiftest of all and that the movement of all other bodies is composite and relatively slow for the reason that each is moving on its own circle with the reverse motion to that of the heavens this at once leads us to expect that the body which is nearest to that first simple revolution should take the longest time to complete its circle and that which is farthest from it the shortest the others taking a longer time the nearer they are and a shorter time the farther away they are for it is the nearest body which is most strongly influenced and the most remote 
by reason of its distance which is least affected the influence on the intermediate bodies varying as the mathematicians show with their distance chapter eleven with regard to the shape of each star the most reasonable view is that they are spherical it has been shown that it is not in their nature to move themselves and since nature is no wanton or random creator clearly she will have given things which possess no movement a shape particularly unadapted to movement such a shape is the sphere since it possesses no instrument of movement clearly then their mass will have the form of a sphere again what holds of one holds of all and the evidence of our eyes shows us that the moon is spherical for how else should the moon as it waxes and wanes show for the most part a crescent-shaped or gibbous figure and only at one moment a half-moon and astronomical arguments give further confirmation for no other hypothesis accounts for the crescent shape of the sun's eclipses one then of the heavenly bodies being spherical clearly the rest will be spherical also chapter twelve there are two difficulties which may very reasonably here be raised of which we must now attempt to state the probable solution for we regard the zeal of one whose thirst after philosophy leads him to accept even slight indications where it is very difficult to see one's way as a proof rather of modesty than of overconfidence of many such problems one of the strangest is the problem why we find the greatest number of movements in the intermediate bodies and not rather in each successive body a variety of movement proportionate to its distance from the primary motion for we should expect since the primary body shows one motion only that the body which is nearest to it should move with the fewest movements say two and the one next after that with three or some similar arrangement but the opposite is the case the movements of the sun and moon are fewer than those of some of the planets yet these planets are farther from the centre and thus nearer to the primary body than they as observation has itself revealed for we have seen the moon half full pass beneath the planet mars which vanished on its shadow side and came forth by the bright and shining part similar accounts of other stars are given by the egyptians and babylonians whose observations have been kept for very many years past and from whom much of our evidence about particular stars is derived a second difficulty which may with equal justice be raised is this why is it that the primary motion includes such a multitude of stars that their whole array seems to defy counting while of the other stars each one is separated off and in no case do we find two or more attached to the same motion on these questions i say it is well that we should seek to increase our understanding though we have but little to go upon and are placed at so great a distance from the facts in question nevertheless there are certain principles on which if we base our consideration we shall not find this difficulty by any means insoluble we may object that we have been thinking of the stars as mere bodies and as units with a serial order indeed but entirely inanimate but should rather conceive them as enjoying life and action on this view the facts cease to appear surprising for it is natural that the best conditioned of all things should have its good without action that that which is nearest to it should achieve it by little and simple action and that which is farther removed by a complexity of actions just as with men's bodies one is in good condition without exercise at all another after a short walk while another requires running and wrestling and hard training 
and there are yet others who however hard they worked themselves could never secure this good but only some substitute for it to succeed often or in many things is difficult for instance to throw ten thousand cone throws with the dice would be impossible but to throw one or two is comparatively easy in action again when a has to be done to get b b to get c and c to get d one step or two present little difficulty but as the series extends the difficulty grows we must then think of the action of the lower stars as similar to that of animals and plants for on our earth it is man that has the greatest variety of actions for there are many goods that man can secure hence his actions are various and directed to ends beyond them while the perfectly conditioned has no need of action since it is itself the end and action always requires two terms end and means the lower animals have less variety of action than man and plants perhaps have little action and of one kind only for either they have but one attainable good as indeed man has or if several each contributes directly to their ultimate good one thing then has and enjoys the ultimate good other things attain to it one immediately by few steps another by many while yet another does not even attempt to secure it but is satisfied to reach a point not far removed from that consummation thus taking health as the end there will be one thing that always possesses health others that attain it one by reducing flesh another by running and thus reducing flesh another by taking steps to enable himself to run thus further increasing the number of movements while another cannot attain health itself but only running or reduction of flesh so that one or other of these is for such a being the end for while it is clearly best for any being to attain the real end yet if that cannot be the nearer it is to the best the better will be its state it is for this reason that the earth moves not at all and the bodies near to it with few movements for they do not attain the final end but only come as near to it as their share in the divine principle permits but the first heaven finds it immediately with a single movement and the bodies intermediate between the first and last heavens attain it indeed but at the cost of a multiplicity of movement as to the difficulty that into the one primary motion is crowded a vast multitude of stars while of the other stars each has been separately given special movements of its own there is in the first place this reason for regarding the arrangement as a natural one in thinking of the life and moving principle of the several heavens one must regard the first as far superior to the others such a superiority would be reasonable for this single first motion has to move many of the divine bodies while the numerous other motions move only one each since each single planet moves with a variety of motions thus then nature makes matters equal and establishes a certain order giving to the single motion many bodies and to the single body many motions and there is a second reason why the other motions have each only one body in that each of them except the last i e that which contains the one star is really moving many bodies for this last sphere moves with many others to which it is fixed each sphere being actually a body so that its movement will be a joint product each sphere in fact has its particular natural motion to which the general movement is as it were added but the force of any limited body is only adequate to moving a limited body 
the characteristics of the stars which move with a circular motion in respect of substance and shape movement and order have now been sufficiently explained end of chapter twelve recording in memory of mitchell edwards chapter thirteen of book two of on the heavens by aristotle translated by j l stocks this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by geoffrey edwards chapter thirteen it remains to speak of the earth of its position of the question whether it is at rest or in motion and of its shape one as to its position there is some difference of opinion most people all in fact who regard the whole heaven as finite say it lies at the centre but the italian philosophers known as pythagoreans take the contrary view at the centre they say is fire and the earth is one of the stars creating night and day by its circular motion about the centre they further construct another earth in opposition to ours to which they give the name counter-earth in all this they are not seeking for theories and causes to account for observed facts but rather forcing their observations and trying to accommodate them to certain theories and opinions of their own but there are many others who would agree that it is wrong to give the earth the central position looking for confirmation rather to theory than to the facts of observation their view is that the most precious place befits the most precious thing but fire they say is more precious than earth and the limit than the intermediate and the circumference and the centre are limits reasoning on this basis they take the view that it is not earth that lies at the centre of the sphere but rather fire the pythagoreans have a further reason they hold that the most important part of the world which is the centre should be most strictly guarded and name it or rather the fire which occupies that place the quote, guard house of zeus close quote, as if the word centre were quite unequivocal and the centre of the mathematical figure were always the same with that of the thing or the natural centre but it is better to conceive of the case of the whole heaven as analogous to that of animals in which the centre of the animal and that of the body are different for this reason they have no need to be so disturbed about the world or to call in a guard for its centre rather let them look for the centre in the other sense and tell us what it is like and where nature has set it that centre will be something primary and precious but to the mere position we should give the last place rather than the first for the middle is what is defined and what defines it is the limit and that which contains or limits is more precious than that which is limited seeing that the latter is the matter and the former the essence of the system two as to the position of the earth then this is the view which some advance and the views advanced concerning its rest or motion are similar for here too there is no general agreement all who deny that the earth lies at the centre think that it revolves about the centre and not the earth only but as we said before the counter earth as well some of them even consider it possible that there are several bodies so moving which are invisible to us owing to the interposition of the earth this they say accounts for the fact that eclipses of the moon are more frequent than eclipses of the sun for in addition to the earth each of these moving bodies can obstruct it indeed as in any case the surface of the earth is not actually a centre but distant from it a full hemisphere there is no more difficulty they think in accounting for the observed facts on their view that we do not dwell at the centre 
than on the common view that the earth is in the middle even as it is there is nothing in the observations to suggest that we are removed from the centre by half the diameter of the earth others again say that the earth which lies at the centre is quotes, rolled and thus in motion about the axis of the whole heaven so it stands written in the timaeus three there are similar disputes about the shape of the earth some think it is spherical others that it is flat and drum-shaped for evidence they bring the fact that as the sun rises and sets the part concealed by the earth shows a straight and not a curved edge whereas if the earth were spherical the line of section would have to be circular in this they leave out of account the great distance of the sun from the earth and the great size of the circumference which seen from a distance on these apparently small circles appears straight such an appearance ought not to make them doubt the circular shape of the earth but they have another argument they say that because it is at rest the earth must necessarily have this shape for there are many different ways in which the movement or rest of the earth has been conceived the difficulty must have occurred to every one it would indeed be a complacent mind that felt no surprise that while a little bit of earth let loose in mid-air moves and will not stay still and the more there is of it the faster it moves the whole earth free in mid-air should show no movement at all yet here is this great weight of earth and it is at rest and again from beneath one of these moving fragments of earth before it falls take away the earth and it will continue its downward movement with nothing to stop it the difficulty then has naturally passed into a commonplace of philosophy and one may well wonder that the solutions offered are not seen to involve greater absurdities than the problem itself by these considerations some have been led to assert that the earth below us is infinite saying with xenophanes of colophon that it has quote, pushed its roots to infinity close quote, in order to save the trouble of seeking for the cause hence the sharp rebuke of empedocles in the words quote, if the deeps of the earth are endless and endless the ample ether such is the vain tale told by many a tongue poured from the mouths of those who have seen but little of the whole Close quote. others say the earth rests upon water this indeed is the oldest theory that has been preserved and is attributed to thales of miletus it was supposed to stay still because it floated like wood and other similar substances which are so constituted as to rest upon water but not upon air as if the same account had not to be given of the water which carries the earth as of the earth itself it is not the nature of water any more than of earth to stay in mid-air it must have something to rest upon again as air is lighter than water so is water than earth how then can they think that the naturally lighter substance lies below the heavier again if the earth as a whole is capable of floating upon water that must obviously be the case with any part of it but observation shows that this is not the case any piece of earth goes to the bottom the quicker the larger it is these thinkers seem to push their inquiries some way into the problem but not so far as they might it is what we are all inclined to do to direct our inquiry not by the matter itself but by the views of our opponents and even when interrogating oneself one pushes the inquiry only to the point at which one can no longer offer any opposition hence a good inquirer will be one who is ready in bringing forward the objections proper to the genus and that he will be when he has gained an understanding of all the differences anaximenes and anaxagoras and democritus give the flatness of the earth as the cause of its staying still thus they say it does not cut but covers like a lid the air beneath it this seems to be the way of flat-shaped bodies 
for even the wind can scarcely move them because of their power of resistance the same immobility they say is produced by the flatness of the surface which the earth presents to the air which underlies it while the air not having room enough to change its place because it is underneath the earth stays there in a mass like the water in the case of the water clock and they adduce an amount of evidence to prove that air when cut off and at rest can bear a considerable weight now first if the shape of the earth is not flat its flatness cannot be the cause of its immobility but in their own account it is rather the size of the earth than its flatness that causes it to remain at rest for the reason why the air is so closely confined that it cannot find a passage and therefore stays where it is is its great amount and this amount is great because the body which isolates it the earth is very large this result then will follow even if the earth is spherical so long as it retains its size so far as their arguments go the earth will still be at rest in general our quarrel with those who speak of movement in this way cannot be confined to the parts it concerns the whole universe one must decide at the outset whether bodies have a natural movement or not whether there is no natural but only constrained movement seeing however that we have already decided this matter to the best of our ability we are entitled to treat our results as representing fact bodies we say which have no natural movement have no constrained movement and where there is no natural and no constrained movement there will be no movement at all this is a conclusion the necessity of which we have already decided and we have seen further that rest also will be inconceivable since rest like movement is either natural or constrained but if there is any natural movement constraint will not be the sole principle of motion or of rest if then it is by constraint that the earth now keeps its place the so-called whirling movement by which its parts came together at the centre was also constrained the form of causation supposed they all borrow from observations of liquids and of air in which the larger and heavier bodies always move to the centre of the whirl this is thought by all those who try to generate the heavens to explain why the earth came together at the centre they then seek a reason for its staying there and some say in the manner explained that the reason is its size and flatness others with empedocles that the motion of the heavens moving about it at a higher speed prevents movement of the earth as the water in a cup when the cup is given a circular motion though it is often underneath the bronze is for this same reason prevented from moving with the downward movement which is natural to it but suppose both the quotes, whirl and its flatness the air beneath being withdrawn cease to prevent the earth's motion where will the earth move to then its movement to the centre was constrained and its rest at the centre is due to constraint but there must be some motion which is natural to it will this be upward motion or downward or what it must have some motion and if upward and downward motion are alike to it and the air above the earth does not prevent upward movement then no more could air below it prevent downward movement for the same cause must necessarily have the same effect on the same thing further against empedocles there is another point which might be made when the elements were separated off by hate what caused the earth to keep its place surely the quotes, whirl cannot have been then also the cause it is absurd too not to perceive that while the whirling movement may have been responsible for the original coming together of the parts of earth at the centre the question remains why now do all heavy bodies move to the earth for the whirl surely does not come near us why again does fire move upward not surely because of the whirl but 
if fire is naturally such as to move in a certain direction clearly the same may be supposed to hold of earth again it cannot be the whirl which determines the heavy and the light rather that movement caused the pre-existent heavy and light things to go to the middle and stay on the surface respectively thus before ever the world began heavy and light existed and what can have been the ground of their distinction or the manner and direction of their natural movements in the infinite chaos there can have been neither above nor below and it is by these that heavy and light are determined it is to these causes that most writers pay attention but there are some anaximander for instance among the ancients who say that the earth keeps its place because of its indifference motion upward and downward and sideways were all they thought equally inappropriate to that which is set at the centre and indifferently related to every extreme point and to move in contrary directions at the same time was impossible so it must needs remain still this view is ingenious but not true the argument would prove that everything whatever it be which is put at the centre must stay there fire then will rest at the centre for the proof turns on no peculiar property of earth but this does not follow the observed facts about earth are not only that it remains at the centre but also that it moves to the centre the place to which any fragment of earth moves must necessarily be the place to which the whole moves and in the place to which a thing naturally moves it will naturally rest the reason then is not in the fact that the earth is indifferently related to every extreme point for this would apply to any body whereas movement to the centre is peculiar to earth again it is absurd to look for a reason why the earth remains at the centre and not for a reason why fire remains at the extremity if the extremity is the natural place of fire clearly earth must also have a natural place but suppose that the centre is not its place and that the reason of its remaining there is this necessity of indifference on the analogy of the hair which it is said however great the tension will not break under it if it be evenly distributed or of the man who though exceedingly hungry and thirsty and both equally yet being equidistant from food and drink is therefore bound to stay where he is even so it still remains to explain why fire stays at the extremities it is strange too to ask about things staying still but not about their motion why i mean one thing if nothing stops it moves up and another thing to the centre again their statements are not true it happens indeed to be the case that a thing to which movement this way and that is equally inappropriate is obliged to remain at the centre but so far as their argument goes instead of remaining there it will move only not as a mass but in fragments for the argument applies equally to fire fire if set at the centre should stay there like earth since it will be indifferently related to every point on the extremity nevertheless it will move as in fact it always does move when nothing stops it away from the centre to the extremity it will not however move in a mass to a single point on the circumference the only possible result on the lines of the indifference theory but rather each corresponding portion of fire to the corresponding part of the extremity each fourth part for instance to a fourth part of the circumference for since no body is a point it will have parts the expansion when the body increased the place occupied would be on the same principle as the contraction in which the place was diminished thus for all the indifference theory shows to the contrary earth also would have moved in this manner away from the centre unless the centre had been its natural place we have now outlined the views held as to the shape position and rest or movement of the earth chapter fourteen 
let us first decide the question whether the earth moves or is at rest for as we said there are some who make it one of the stars and others who setting it at the centre suppose it to be quotes, rolled and in motion about the pole as axis that both views are untenable will be clear if we take as our starting point the fact that the earth's motion whether the earth be at the centre or away from it must needs be a constrained motion it cannot be the movement of the earth itself if it were any portion of it would have this movement but in fact every part moves in a straight line to the centre being then constrained and unnatural the movement could not be eternal but the order of the universe is eternal again everything that moves with the circular movement except the first sphere is observed to be past and to move with more than one motion the earth then also whether it move about the centre or as stationary at it must necessarily move with two motions but if this were so there would have to be passings and turnings of the fixed stars yet no such thing is observed the same stars always rise and set in the same parts of the earth further the natural movement of the earth part and whole alike is to the centre of the whole whence the fact that it is now actually situated at the centre but it might be questioned since both centres are the same which centre it is that portions of earth and other heavy things move to is this their goal because it is the centre of the earth or because it is the centre of the whole the goal surely must be the centre of the whole for fire and other light things move to the extremity of the area which contains the centre it happens however that the centre of the earth and of the whole is the same thus they do move to the centre of the earth but accidentally in virtue of the fact that the earth's centre lies at the centre of the whole that the centre of the earth is the goal of their movement is indicated by the fact that heavy bodies moving towards the earth do not move parallel but so as to make equal angles and thus to a single centre that of the earth it is clear then that the earth must be at the centre and immovable not only for the reasons already given but also because heavy bodies forcibly thrown quite straight upward return to the point from which they started even if they are thrown to an infinite distance from these considerations then it is clear that the earth does not move and does not lie elsewhere than at the centre from what we have said the explanation of the earth's immobility is also apparent if it is the nature of earth as observation shows to move from any point to the centre as a fire contrariwise to move from the centre to the extremity it is impossible that any portion of earth should move away from the centre except by constraint for a single thing has a single movement and a simple thing a simple contrary movements cannot belong to the same thing and movement away from the centre is the contrary of movement to it if then no portion of earth can move away from the centre obviously still less can the earth as a whole so move for it is the nature of the whole to move to the point to which the part naturally moves since then it would require a force greater than itself to move it it must needs stay at the centre this view is further supported by the contributions of mathematicians to astronomy since the observations made as the shapes change by which the order of the stars is determined are fully accounted for on the hypothesis that the earth lies at the centre of the position of the earth and of the manner of its rest or movement our discussion may here end its shape must necessarily be spherical for every portion of earth has weight until it reaches the centre and the jostling of parts greater and smaller would bring about not a waved surface but rather compression and convergence of part and part until the centre is reached 
the process should be conceived by supposing the earth to come into being in the way that some of the natural philosophers describe only they attribute the downward movement to constraint and it is better to keep to the truth and say that the reason of this motion is that a thing which possesses weight is naturally endowed with a centripetal movement when the mixture then was merely potential the things that were separated off moved similarly from every side towards the centre whether the parts which came together at the centre were distributed at the extremities evenly or in some other way makes no difference if on the one hand there were a similar movement from each quarter of the extremity to the single centre it is obvious that the resulting mass would be similar on every side for if an equal amount is added on every side the extremity of the mass will be everywhere equidistant from its centre i e the figure will be spherical but neither will it in any way affect the argument if there is not a similar accession of concurrent fragments from every side for the greater quantity finding a lesser in front of it must necessarily drive it on both having an impulse whose goal is the centre and the greater weight driving the lesser forward till this goal is reached in this we have also the solution of a possible difficulty the earth it might be argued is at the centre and spherical in shape if then a weight many times that of the earth were added to one hemisphere the centre of the earth and of the whole will no longer be coincident so that either the earth will not stay still at the centre or if it does it will be at rest without having its centre at the place to which it is still its nature to move such is the difficulty a short consideration will give us an easy answer if we first give precision to our postulate that any body endowed with weight of whatever size moves towards the centre clearly it will not stop when its edge touches the centre the greater quantity must prevail until the body's centre occupies the centre for that is the goal of its impulse now it makes no difference whether we apply this to a clod or a common fragment of earth or to the earth as a whole the fact indicated does not depend upon degrees of size but applies universally to everything that has the centripetal impulse therefore earth in motion whether in a mass or in fragments necessarily continues to move until it occupies the centre equally every way the less being forced to equalize itself by the greater owing to the forward drive of the impulse if the earth was generated then it must have been formed in this way and so clearly its generation was spherical and if it is ungenerated and has remained so always its character must be that which the initial generation if it had occurred would have given it but the spherical shape necessitated by this argument follows also from the fact that the motions of heavy bodies always make equal angles and are not parallel this would be the natural form of movement towards what is naturally spherical either then the earth is spherical or it is at least naturally spherical and it is right to call anything that which nature intends it to be and which belongs to it rather than that which it is by constraint and contrary to nature the evidence of the senses further corroborates this how else would eclipses of the moon show segments shaped as we see them as it is the shapes which the moon itself each month shows are of every kind straight gibbous and concave but in eclipses the outline is always curved and since it is the interposition of the earth that makes the eclipse the form of this line will be caused by the form of the earth's surface which is therefore spherical again our observations of the stars make it evident not only that the earth is circular but also that it is a circle of no great size for quite a small change of position to south or north causes a manifest alteration of the horizon there is much change i mean in the stars which are overhead 
and the stars seen are different as one moves northward or southward indeed there are some stars seen in egypt and in the neighbourhood of cyprus which are not seen in the northerly regions and stars which in the north are never beyond the range of observation in those regions rise and set all of which goes to show not only that the earth is circular in shape but also that it is a sphere of no great size for otherwise the effect of so slight a change of place would not be so quickly apparent hence one should not be too sure of the incredibility of the view of those who conceive that there is continuity between the parts about the pillars of hercules and the parts about india and that in this way the ocean is one as further evidence in favour of this they quote the case of elephants a species occurring in each of these extreme regions suggesting that the common characteristic of these extremes is explained by their continuity also those mathematicians who try to calculate the size of the earth's circumference arrive at the figure four hundred thousand stades this indicates not only that the earth's mass is spherical in shape but also that as compared with the stars it is not of great size end of chapter fourteen and end of book two recording in memory of mitchell edwards